Pursuant to the motion adopted on April 25th, the committee is meeting with the delegation from the Central Tibetan Administration. As always, interpretation is available through the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. And for members participating in person, keep in mind the Board of Internal Economies guidelines for mask use and health protocols. I would like to take this opportunity to remind all participants to this meeting that screenshots or taking photos of your screen is not permitted. Before speaking, please wait until I recognize you by name. When speaking, please speak slowly and clearly. When you're not speaking, your mic should be on mute. A reminder that all comments by members and witnesses should be addressed through the chair. I would now like to welcome our witnesses and would like to thank them for taking the time to be here with us today. At the table, we have Sikyong Penpa Tsiring, President of the Central Tibetan Administration, the Venerable Tenzin Rabyal, Abbot of the Penchen Lama Monastery, and Dr. Namgyal Chodup, Representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama at the Office of Tibet in Washington. I'd like to recognize that we also have several other members of the delegation in our audience today, and I thank them as well. Sikyong, I would like to turn the floor over to you for five minutes for your opening statement. Please, please proceed. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members of the Standing Committee of Foreign Affairs uh, Committee. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to present the case of Pension Rinpoche uh, and the uh, status of Tibet and our analysis of the situation uh, that concerns Tibet. Uh, before uh, I hand over the floor to my colleague, Sigeb Rinpoche, who is the abbot of the, Pen the Dashil Humbu Monastery, uh, the traditional seat of the Penchen Lamas through many centuries. Uh, I just would like to uh, say that this is uh, uh, a representative case of many other Tibetans who also suffer the same fate, uh, and Panjim Rinpoche's case is one of those of forced disappearance even 27 years after his disappearance or abduction by the government of China. We still don't know whether he's alive or not. Uh, uh, they're, they're, the Chinese government always says that he is uh, hale and hearty and he doesn't want to be disturbed. So at least if there is some evidence of whether he is alive or not. That would be soothing for the Tibetans. Uh, we know that this is a political decision by the Chinese government, um, because this also concerns the reincarnation of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, because there are uh, reciprocal uh, recognition of reincarnation between His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Pension Lamas. Uh, I personally feel that China made a big mistake, tactical mistake, but not re by not recognizing the, by Gendi, the, not recognizing Gendi Chujinima, the young boy who was recognized by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. If China had done that, they would have Gendi Chujinima under their control as of today, not the boy selected by the Chinese government and not recognized by the Tibetan people. Even now, if you go to Lhasa, you will not see picture of the Chinese selected pension lama. You will see only the picture of the 10th pension lama. So that is symbolic of Ch Tibetans' non-recognition of China's selection of the pension lama. Uh, we know for a fact that he has not been, if he is alive, he has not been given any religious training to uh, take on his traditional uh, religious leadership. Uh, next to His Holiness the Dalai Lama, thereby incapacitating him in any way, if he, if, even if he is free and uh, even if he is alive and he is left free in the future, uh, they made sure that he, is, he will not be able to perform his religious duties, deprived of his religious, uh, traditional religious teachings. So before I go over to other issues, uh, 
I would request the chair to uh, to allow Sigip Rinpoche, the abbot of Tashlumbu Monastery, to present the case of Pension Lama. And after that, if the chair allows, then I will touch on other issues that concerns the issue of Tibet or the Sino-Tibet conflict. Thank you again, Chair, for the opportunity. Please, uh, please proceed, sir. Tsangmala, Tashi Delay. Tashi Delay to everyone. Ni Tirin, Tensa Tashi Limbu, Kembe Mingdone, Tsamlina, Pugu Nandela, Tesem Shugendang, Draw me, Top Danda, Chede Rangmegi, Top Dang. Chibe Rangwan Top Dang Sola Zigur Shunke Labar Peda Himalaya Zor Chebe Quincy Penchen Rimbucher Teba Shunkingi Chedang Bas Kyo Saya Mangbu Sab Shude Kennedy Sishung La Zaragi Ridu Kaji Nyesen Shuguin. As the abode of Tashilumbu Monastery, I would like to take this opportunity today to make some fervent appeals to the Canadian government on behalf of the millions of disciples of His Holiness the Penchen Lama in Canada, Tibet, Himalayan regions, etc. I would also like to address this appeal to the followers of Tibetan Buddhism throughout the world as well as to the advocates of human rights, religious freedom and the rights of the child. <laughs> Tabdu Currently, we see the Chinese government undertaking ruthless and restrictive policies in Tibet. The situation is worsening day by day. We see human rights being trampled, religious freedom and rights of the child being denied. Those Tibetans who disagree with the Chinese government are being arbitrarily detained and many being dis disappeared. So today I would like to explain this situation in Tibet in the context of the disappearance of an eminent spiritual leader, the 11th Pension Lama Gendin Chugi Nima. Tayang, Chilo Chigdung Gubge Gyeju Gyagulor, Pejong Shigadzer, Pegi Lajin, Benjin Kundin Chuba Chimbucho, Luburdu Kumbo Zobare, Chigdung Gubge Kujo Konga Tawang Abitse Chub Shingin, Consequently, in 1989, the 10th Pension Lama died suddenly and mysteriously while in the town of Shigaze in Tibet, where our main Tashilumbu monastery is located. Subsequently, as per Tibetan Buddhist convention, His Holiness the Dalai Lama announced on May 14, 1995, his recognition of Gendun Chukinyima from Nakchu in Tibet as the unmistaken reincarnation. This was also in accordance with the historical tradition of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Pension Lama, referred to as the father and son, being involved with the recognition of each other as well as in their teacher-student relationship. <laughs> However, sadly, three days after the announcement, on May 17, 1995, the Chinese authorities detained the less than six-year-old Kendun Chukinima, his parents and entourage. They have not been seen since then and 27 years have passed. 
To make matter, matters worse, later in 1995, the Chinese government interfered in our religious process and forcefully appointed a child by the name of Kelsen Norbu as a fake 11th pension lama. Since then, he is being used as a political tool by the Chinese government. <laughs> Therefore, with great concern, I would like to make the following five appeals to the Canadian Parliament and the administration. Tangbo, Canada is a very important issue. The government has been able to get the government 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 to get First, I urge the Canadian Parliament to pass a motion urging the Canadian government to mandate the ambassador to China to meet with the 11th Pension Lama and ascertain his whereabouts and well-being. Niba, Canada is a young man, Pension Gendun Chugin Machola, Konglo Truneche, Tabar Melonishu Zabdin Ring, Dromi, Topdan, the Chede Rangme, Chibe Topdan, so Donna Drode Chosum Top. Second, I urge the Canadian government to honour the 11th Pension Lama with an award recognising him as a victim of enforced disappearance for 27 years and as someone who has been denied of his human rights, religious freedom, rights of a child and other fundamental rights of movement, residency and action. Sumba, Canada, Trezoso, Quincy Pension and Bujicho, Third, in order to enable his early release and as a way to draw attention to his situation, I urge the Canadian Parliament to observe the birthday of the 11th Pension Lama. Shiba, Melo Nishu Zabdu, Kason Chame, the Kirbe Pension Rimbuche, Yangsi, Tsushi, Tsujongi, Unzin Kushap Chare Rimbuche, Yu. Chapsitumbanamchedu Sabduni Fourth, I, uh, I also appeal to the Canadian government to actively call for the release of Chade Rinpoche, a lama of the Tashilumbu Monastery, who was the head of the search committee for the 11th Pension Lama, as well as many other Tibetan political prisoners. On account of the dire situation inside Tibet, Tibetans have been resorting to acts of self-immolation, the latest being a 25-year-old Tibetan singer, Tsawang Nobu, on February 25th, and an 81-year-old man, Tabun, on March 27th this year. At least 157 Tibetans have sacrificed their most cherished lives in order to draw the attention of the international community, including the United Nations, to the critical situation in Tibet. Therefore, I urge the Canadian government to respond positively to their plea. Naba, pe me mangi ngonde chino konsa kemgwe chumbo cho nyurdo pe la pe tup tap dang kongi kongsi yebe ni me ume lamki pe den si jue la mutu kyalkyo nangro shukui. Fifth, the aspiration of the Tibetans in Tibet is for His Holiness the Dalai Lama to be able to return to Tibet at the earliest. Therefore, I urge the Canadian government to consider taking concrete initiatives to support His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the Central Tibetan Administration to enable the resolution of Sino-Tibet conflict through the mutually beneficial middle way approach. <laughs> Canada 
，但你叫我啥也忙不，三观当这位，忙着脱单这位，这段实际一百，看来这兄弟呢，不能给我有个咋的，刚一说他不说，感觉我为，首先能叫我来一切单不有。The Canadian people and government have been consist consistently supporting the Tibetan people, so I take this opportunity to express my sincere gratitude. The five-point appeal I have made today are in one way also connected to the well-being of the several million believers and connected to democratic rights of individuals. I have firm belief. That the Canadian government will consider the reality of the Tibetan situation, particularly on the issue of Penchen Lama, and consider my appeals positively. Tamade zamlina den do shide yonwe rawa da melam shuye tochen. Finally, may peace prevail on earth, and thank you all very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, your opening uh, and profound. Uh, Submission. Uh, we have a number of members of Parliament who will have questions of you now, so we're going to proceed. Uh, first uh, up is um, MP uh, Garnet uh, Genius uh, for six minutes. Please proceed, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. It's such an honor to uh, to be with you today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, when I had only been a member of, of Parliament for a few months, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, His Holiness and Dharamsala, and uh, I didn't know very much about the Tibetan struggle at that time. But uh, that meeting and subsequent conversations have been such a an inspiration to me, in particular the way in which the Tibetan people, who have been the victims of such extraordinary injustice, uh, respond with love, with goodwill, with a desire for uh, for peace and reconciliation. And I find that. Uh, personally inspirational, and uh, and it's I think a, a key feature of what has uh, sustained such such support for the Tibetan cause. Uh, so be assured of my my continuing support. We we take note of the important uh, points and suggestions made with respect to the to Penchant Lama, and uh, I, I assure you that that I will continue to advocate uh, for his release and for the government of Canada to be actively engaged, and and we'll review the the specific suggestions uh, that you made. Uh, I want to share that uh, that our party has has advocated a number of points that are of particular importance around religious freedom. Uh, one is we've consistently advocated the reopening of the Office of Religious Freedom as a as a real center of excellence and a focal point for advocating for religious freedom around the world. Uh, and we see various ways in which the Chinese government is attacking the religious freedom of Tibetans and of other communities uh, in China. Uh, we also have proposed uh, in the last election having a, a publicly published list of prisoners of conscience of particular concern as a way of of highlighting some of these uh, these ongoing cases. Um, and. Uh, and it's great to hear the Tibetan language spoken because one key uh, feature of, of the repression that we see is, is the attacks on language, uh, the number of, uh, of uh, the fact that, that young people in Tibet now are, are uh, forced into schools where, uh, where the language of instruction is, is not their own language. Uh, so I wonder if, uh, maybe just to start off my questions, if, uh, if you could speak specifically to the issue of, of uh, language and education in Tibet and concerns about uh, the attacks on the Tibetan language. <coughs> On the issue of language, I, I want to inform this committee that our language comes from India. Uh, it has nothing to do with Chinese language. Uh, the alphabets of Tibetan language is ka 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 nga. In Hindi, it's ka 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 ga nga. So it's the same uh, language that comes from India. Our religion also comes from India. With uh, regards to language, uh, during Mao Zedong's time, they had to use Tibetan language. There was no other way because Tibetans don't speak Chinese language. And to spread their propaganda, they used Tibetan language. And But during Cultural Revolution, a lot of things were destroyed in the 10 years from 66 to 76. Even before that, the previous Panchen Lama, the 10th Panchen Lama, uh, submitted a 70,000 character report to the Chinese government as early as 1962. Uh, speaking about destruction of Tibetan language and religious heritage in Tibet um, after the communist invasion of Tibet. Uh, now, there was little freedom when Deng Xiaoping came into power and Hu Yaobang, was, uh, Hu Yaobang also visited Tibet and Pension Rinpoche, the former Pension Rinpoche, was also released and Pension Rinpoche was always a very outspoken personality, a leader of Tibetans. Uh, who did not fear persecution, even though he was under house arrest for many, many years and went through very, very repressive uh, uh, 
uh, actions by the Chinese government, including uh, putting on hat uh, on his head and being criticized by his own people, uh, shaming uh, him during those periods. But when after he was released, he played a very, very important role in getting back language and religion and culture uh, on track in Tibet. But unfortunately, he died under very mysterious circumstances in 1989. And when Hu Jintao took over as party secretary, he imposed martial law and there was much more control in Tibet. When Jiang Zemin came as uh, president of China, uh, he even named, uh, at those days, he even named His Holiness as monks in wolf's clothing. So that was the kind of rhetoric that were used, being used uh, during his time. And when Hu Jintao took, us, uh, took, uh, took over as the president of China, then they, he introduced dual language. Uh, that was still okay because you, you have to learn other languages. But when Xi Jinping came into power, it's now one, one nation, one language, one culture. Under this policy, uh, the Chinese Communist Party is striking at the very root of our identity, which is our language. Uh, today, uh, the Chinese language has, be, uh, has to be taught uh, from the preschool, Montessori level, uh, Tibetan language is reduced to just a study of a language. Even if you are proficient in Tibetan language, you, it's very difficult to get jobs. Uh, uh, because, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Sikyang, I, I need to just jump in because of a constraint in my time. Uh, before before my time wraps up, colleagues, I, there, there's been discussions, and, and I, I think this will be a, a matter of quick support, but we've been asked about uh, our, our support for reopening, uh, pushing for the resumption of dialogue. Um, so I would just quickly like to seek the support of the committee for a motion that a notice has been given for that the committee report to the House its call for the immediate resumption of Sino-Tibetan dialogue. And then I'll yield my time after that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Genius, for your motion. Um, is there any debate on the motion? Mr. Oliphant to put his hand up. Yes. Um, Proceed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank uh, Mr. Jennings for the motion. Uh, uh, we are in agreement with the, uh, the sentiment of the motion. It does build on something, and I'm just looking at Mr. Bergeron as well, uh, because it is very similar to a, a motion that we worked on uh, last year, uh, or two year, year and a half ago, and then uh, he presented in the House attempting to get unanimous consent, which didn't have unanimous consent. And I think that some of the depth that was in, uh, in, in the motion that Mr. Bergeron um, uh, put in the House may be helpful to be added to this motion. Um, and it's um, uh, in that one, it calls for dialogue uh, between representatives of the Tibetan people, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, or his representatives, the Central Tibetan Administration, and the government of the People's Republic of China, with a view to enabling Tibet to exercise genuine autonomy within the framework of the, Chine of the Chinese Constitution. I think it was a fuller um, uh, statement, uh, and it involved a number of parties, and that was uh, Mr. Varani was also helpful in shaping that motion. Um, and so I think um, if we could move towards that motion, uh, I, I think it would be a better uh, understanding, and because not, a lot of people just won't know what the middle way is or what something is. So I, I think that that motion that we worked on I think that was at maybe Canada-China Committee, not Foreign Affairs Committee, if I'm correct. Um, so that would be, would be, and, and I, I was going to do this later. I thought this would come up later in the meeting, so I haven't had time to write that out as an amendment. But you're kind of getting the point. I have, I, I, I printed off the um, unanimous consent motion you, uh, Mr. Bergeron, presented last year. Um, my, my other concern is, because we will, I believe, be all in agreement with it, um, I, I would hope that we could take the motion and issue a uh, press release or a media release on this as a statement from our committee uh, that we would do it. And, and I suggest that in, instead of presenting it to the House, because I don't want to, I, I want to move this quickly. I want to get it done. I think I don't want to waste time in the House later if it comes back for concurrence, those kinds of things. I would like to get this out as a statement that we all agree on and, uh, and present unanimity on it. I think especially after the testimony we've heard today. So I could, I could read that um, motion if it's helpful. I have a copy of it if that's helpful for the clerk as well. Uh, and it's sort of amending it to read this, 
and I could read it again if people wanted to hear it. Um, perhaps uh, maybe give the wording to the clerk, okay. um, and then we can have it sent out. J just one second. I have a, uh, I take a point of order over the next speaker. How does it work? I do? Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Genuous, point I, I, point I just wonder if there would be unanimous consent to adjourn debate on this for the time being, if people want to do some wordsmithing, and then it's we can come back order. to it. I, I'm seeing unanimous consent, so it is a... Okay, well, that was going to be my intervention. I think oh, that okay. out of respect sure. for the witnesses, yeah. we should do this later. Ms. Ben, I'll recognize Ms. Ben Dian, but is Thank there? you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was wondering if we could do, proceed with the questions that the witnesses came here sure. to answer and, yeah. and, and do this debate later in the meeting. Yeah, I think we should circle back to the uh, wording of the motion towards the end of the meeting. Uh, next, um, we have um, MP Ara Ferrani for six minutes of questions. Uh, at at uh, five minutes and 30 seconds, I will just uh, say into the mic, 30 seconds. Uh, and uh, just in terms of clarifying my own position with respect to the Sino-Tibetan dialogue, I was in favor of it when it came uh, before the Canada-China Committee. I'm in favor of it at all times. It is something that is critical in terms of resuming. Uh, so just let me be clear about that. First of all, Tujiche Gadinche, thank you for being here, Sikyong. Thank you, uh, uh, Rinpoche La. It is very critical what you are talking about today, and we are very pleased to have you here in the committee uh, prevent, pr pr providing this testimony. On behalf of the thousands of Tibetan Canadians I represent and on behalf of the thousands of Tibetan Canadians that I've interacted with in this country, uh, I wanted to talk to you first about the Panchen Lama. And I think it's, it should be clear to everyone that the Panchen Lama is not the uh, heir to the throne of the Dalai Lama, but they work in conjunction. One recognizes the other's incarnation. And that when we say that the Chinese have taken control of the Panchen Lama and forced him to disappear and named a replacement, that what they're doing is trying to take control of the succession. So in the event of His Holiness's passing, they would attempt to control the reincarnation, which to me strikes at the core of what we're talking about when we talk about religious freedom. And that is clearly what is at issue here. You know that the Canadian government has been long-standing in its position about the whereabouts of the Panchen Lama, going back to 1995. In 1998, a thousand birthday cards were delivered by Canadian children to the Panchen Lama, which on what would have been approximately his ninth birthday. Even as recently as 2016, 2017, we were making formal representations uh, in this regard. We will continue to do that as parliamentarians. I will continue to do that on behalf of my constituents, and I think everyone here in this committee will continue to speak to that issue. But can you tell me, with respect to uh, the succession issue, um, what do you foresee, foresee as the dangers with respect to not identifying and locating the Panchen Lama and ascertaining his whereabouts? If that is not done immediately, what is the danger that that presents? And if you could just respond in about 60 seconds, because I have a few other questions. Please. <clears throat> Even though there is a tradition of uh, Panchen Lamas recognizing uh, the Dalai Lama and Dalai Lamas recognizing the Panchen Lamas, uh, <clears throat> the ultimate uh, issue that relates with reincarnation concerns the person who is going to be reincarnated. And the person who is going to be reincarnated leaves signs and messages that defines where or uh, when, uh, to which family uh, the person will be born. So irrespective of whether the Panchen Lama is there or not, uh, there will be a system in place uh, that will be decided by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And we've just been talking about the Sino-Tibetan dialogue, and I know that that dialogue had, at one time was quite robust. In terms of my own readings, there was about nine different rounds of meetings between 2002 and 2010, and then an abrupt stop. And since 2010, the positions have hardened, the dialogue has ceased, <coughs> uh, and under President, uh, Premier Xi, we know that it has hardened even further. Uh, can you tell us why is it important to address the Sino-Tibetan dialogue and a little bit more about the middle way? Because everything I hear about the middle way reminds me of simply things that remind me of the Canadian Federation and what we give to provinces over control over certain jurisdictions. And yet it is constantly portrayed in terms of propaganda exercises by the Chinese Communist Party as some sort of independence revolutionary movement. I do not think it is that, but can you address that, Sikyong, about the nature of the middle way approach and what is meant to be achieved under the Sino-Tibetan dialogue? Uh, if the, with the permission of the chair, I would like to take a little more time on this because this is one of the most important uh, issues that concerns us, the Sino-Tibet the, uh, conflict. Um, since 2010, there have been no traction whatsoever from the Chinese side. They stopped uh, because 
the reason why now on hindsight we know for a fact that the reason why they wanted to resume uh, or start dialogue in 2002 was mainly to see that Tibetans don't protest the coming out party of China, that is the 2008 Olympics. So therefore the dialogue went on for some time, but there was no concrete result out of that. And since 2010, it stopped. Uh, therefore, uh, as you all know, I uh, took over the responsibility of Sikong on May 27th last year, and there was pandemic, and I could not travel uh, to other countries except for Italy and Switzerland last November. And this time, before coming here, we had a series of uh, one uh, roundtable meeting with our friends in Europe to understand the situation, the current situation in Ukraine, post-Ukraine. Uh, implications to the world, a new, new world order that might emerge and, cons uh, and see how Europeans would look at China uh, under those circumstances. Uh, so it was quite educating for me and then I went on to have uh, uh, meetings because this time I visited the United States on the invitation of Speaker Pelosi and we have had series of meetings with Under Secretary uh, Azra Zeya, uh, who was appointed by the Biden administration not even one year into coming coming into office uh, at the level of Under Secretary, because under Obama administration is well Under Secretary, then it went down to Assistant Secretary during Trump administration. Now it's elevated back back to Under Secretary, and uh, she will be very soon visiting Dharamsala after my return to Dharamsala and meet with His Holiness and see how our administration works. She also helped organize a, a roundtable meeting with ambassadors where the Canadian chief of, uh, deputy chief of mission was also present because the idea was to see how like-minded countries can come together uh, on the dialogue, uh, uh, resumption of dialogue. And uh, then uh, we also met with Kurt Campbell uh, of the National Security Council. Uh, uh, responsible for Indo-Pacific, and, and we had a series of meetings in the Congress, including a very long meeting with Speaker Pelosi and uh, ranking members of both House Foreign Affairs Committee and Senate Foreign, Foreign Relations Committee. Now, uh, we uh, feel that there should be a change in the narrative, because Chinese propaganda and narrative is so strong that they make it uh, believe as if Tibet has been part of China since time immemorial. And they have the manpower and the resources to do that. And uh, people don't study about Tibetan history. But I would like to uh, uh, note that this book, or the Tibet, 20, Tibet Brief 2020, written by Michael Van Wall Van Prak, his, uh, uh, his last assignment was a professor at Stanford and his uh, uh, expert on international law and uh, on the uh, uh, history of Tibet. So, unfortunately, most of the sources of information for the Western world regarding the history of uh, Asia comes from China, particularly East, East Asia comes from Chinese sources. What he did in this book over the last 10 years, working with about 70 experts from Inner Asia, not just China, but Japan, Russia, Mongolia, uh, uh, Uyghur, uh, and Central Asian countries, he concludes that whether it's to do with the Mongolian order, and when he says Mongolian order, our relation uh, with China has been there uh, from 7th to 9th century. And at that time, Tibet was a big empire, having conquered uh, the Chinese capital, Xi'an, those days, and up to Samarkand in Uzbekistan today. So Tibet was a big empire. Then we had 400 years of disintegration. And during those periods, we had relations with the Mongols from 1220 onwards. and. Even Mr. Sikhan, uh, the I'm appointment sorry to, uh, the, Mr. Sikhan, uh, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, just uh, out of fairness, we have so many members who want to ask questions. Perhaps you could continue with your okay. uh, explanation in, in concert with the questions from all the members. I want to make sure that everybody has the, a chance to get in. It's been close to, well, eight, over eight minutes rounds. We usually have six-minute rounds in the first. So I'm going to go move on to um, our next member of parliament, uh, MP Stéphane Bergeron, for his question. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As the Tibetan language, uh, to the Tibetan language as the core of the Tibetan uh, identity, so if you will allow me, I will speak in my own langu in language, which is French, so put on your 
your headpiece, your earpiece, in order to have uh, uh, simultaneous uh, translation. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Chair, the Sik Young asked us. to show understanding, to allow him to provide the answer to Mr. Virani's question. So with your permission, I would ask Sik Young to continue his presentation, his answer to Mr. Virani. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> so I won't go too much in the, into history because uh, uh, this book says that whether it's according to the Mongolian order or the Chinese order or the Manchu order or the Tibetan order or as per international law today, Tibet has never been considered part of China. Uh, then we have another book written by a Chinese professor called Professor Lao Han Tin, who is also now based in San Diego. He was a professor of uh, the City University of uh, Hong Kong. And he studied the Manchu period. His, his study was based on the historical imperial records of the Manchus that says that Manchus never considered Tibet as part of China. So uh, therefore, uh, Chinese narrative to the international community is misleading. And uh, now it is important that uh, the countries recognize the historical independent status of Tibet by that, I do not mean to say that we are going to change our position from middle way approach to independence. But when countries say that Tibet is part of PRC, then you are going against international law because the one agreement that we have with China is the 1951 17 point agreement that was signed under duress after the invasion of Tibet in 1950, and that is illegal and unfair. So, uh, on the other hand, uh, 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 when you say Tibet is part of PRC, then you are telling the Chinese government, you can do whatever you inside do, uh, with Tibet, inside Tibet, and we will not interfere in whatever you do. Uh, on the other hand, countries also support negotiation between His Holiness the Dalai Lama's representative or CTA leadership with the Chinese government. And we find this a contradiction because there is no leverage for the middle way approach. The people don't realize that His Holiness has climbed down from independence to the middle way approach, uh, which is seeking autonomy for Tibet. Uh, for the Tibetan people to be able, able to preserve their language, culture, religion, way of life, and their environment, which is also very important not only for the Tibetans but uh, to the whole region. Therefore, we urge the governments uh, to change their position if possible, and if it is not possible, please do not repeat this statement that Tibet is part of PRC. When you do that, then you are kowtowing to the Chinese. You are listening to the command of the Chinese, and China respects only strength, not weakness. If countries want to be the pony, they'll write you again and again, they'll write you again and again, and they will not respect you at all. If you are able to stand up, uh, and I, I, I request you to read this book, and the, the translation of the Chinese version will also be coming out soon. And these are latest books. Not, we are not talking about Tibetans. This His Holiness has always said, that uh, uh, when Chinese put this precondition that His Holiness should say Tibet is part of uh, People's Republic of China, they also put the precondition that His Holiness should say Taiwan is part of China. And His Holiness uh, cannot represent the Taiwanese people. And His Holiness said uh, uh, this uh, uh, answer that I'm not a historian. Let us leave history to historians. And this is what historians are talking about, the history of Tibet. But His Holiness is very pragmatic, and we look at the reality of the situation inside Tibet. And for, me, for us, what is more important is the preservation of the very identity of the Tibetan people. Therefore, I urge governments, particularly Canadian government, not to repeat this statement that Tibet is part of PRC, kowtowing to the Chinese government. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bergeron. You have another uh, just under two minutes. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You referred earlier to Taiwan. I'll note that in the room we have the representative from Taiwan in Ottawa. So thank you for your presence, Mr. Chen. In August 2020, we received your predecessor, Sik Yang, Lang Seng Sange, who was very critical 
of the behavior of the People's Republic of China towards Tibet and Hong Kong in particular, but surprised us by having a lot of optimism. And it's with that in mind that I had presented in the wake of the discussions that were held at the Special Committee on Canada-China that I presented in the House the motion Mr. Oliphant read earlier. Because we felt there was optimism from Tibet. And I feel that that optimism has faded. Could you indicate what has changed between the time when we met Mr. Sange in August 2020 and today? That optimism that we felt in his comments seems to have faded. <clears throat> now, since that time, uh, at that time, we were not very sure about Xi Jinping asking for a third term. Now he's asking for a third term. And unlike uh, uh, his predecessors, his, he has been consolidating all his powers. And it's a very dangerous trend. Uh, he likes to be called as the co-leader, comparable to Mao Zedong. Uh, and uh, his new policies of one country, one language, one culture, uh, that is striking at the very identity of not just the Tibetans, but also the Uyghurs, even Cantonese-speaking Chinese uh, have to face that. And uh, uh, we Sikhan, find that I'm uh, so sorry to interrupt these again. are uh, very dangerous trends. I just trends. Um, wanted to clarify, um, just to be fair to all members, I know it is Mc Ms. McPherson's round, and I want to make sure everyone has a chance to uh, uh, ask mm -hmm. you uh, and hear from you uh, very important information you have. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Ms. McPherson, and she can decide if she wants you to continue with this answer to uh, ask a different question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, six Chair. Six minutes, Ms. McPherson. Thank you all so much for for being here today. It's it's a great honor, and it's a it's a pleasure to have all of the guests in the room with us today as well. Um, it it would be it, it would be rude of me not to to ask you to please continue with your answer. So uh, these are the challenges we face with President Xi Jinping at the helm. Uh, we are not against multiculturalism. We are not against development. But when a majority community uh, completely overwhelms a minority community, that leads to cultural genocide. What is happening in Ugo is happening on an industrial scale. And the present uh, party secretary of uh, uh, Uyghur was stationed in, in, in Tibet from 2011 to 2016. And Tibet always used to be the testing ground for new policies. And after having tested these policies inside Tibet, he implemented that in Uyghur. Uh, uh, therefore, the, uh, the restrictions on the, and the gridlock system, when he was working in Tibet as the party secretary, the gridlock system that he introduced it has no, now been so strong that it's, very, it's not possible for Tibetans to come out. Uh, to protest uh, or to the, uh, control the surveillance on the Tibetan people is so strong and they use all kinds of modern technology to surveil on the monastic institutions, on the individuals. Um, so therefore, you do not hear much about Tibetans being able to do anything except burn themselves, hoping against hope. 157 Tibetans have burned themselves, hoping against hope that the Chinese government will give some attention to their plight or the international community will do something for them. But unfortunately, that is not forthcoming. So, uh, but uh, under President Xi Jinping, the things look very dire, and uh, even uh, hopes for negotiation in the immediate future seem to be remote. Thank you very much. And you, you spoke about the Uyghurs. I was one of the members of the subcommittee in Canada that that found did a, undertook a study on the, the um, situation of the Uyghurs and found that there were examples of genocide. That it was a genocide being being perpetrated. Um, in twenty twenty one, the Canadian government imposed sanctions. Um, I'm wondering whether or not you think that those were effective, if you think that, um, that that effectively helped the situation there, or what more Canada could do um, in, in that situation that may also be applicable to the Tibetan situation? Um, 
<clears throat> whether the sanctions are uh, effective or not, I think, uh, uh, depends on the level of sanctions because China is huge and the economy is huge. So, uh, and one thing that you have power on, on is your own people, your own businesses. So you can definitely tell your businesses not to invest in Tibet or Uyghur where they're using forced labor or uh, those kind of things. But uh, uh, imposing other sanctions on China, I don't know how effective that is because they will have a lot of other avenues to avoid uh, uh, implications of those sanctions. But you can definitely tell your, tell your business people not to invest in Uyghur or Tibet where they are. And I think we can do much more in this country in that in that front. There's there's certain pieces of legislation that have come forward by by different um, individual members. I think the government has been slow to bring that forward that legislation. So I'm I'm hopeful that individual members will bring forward legislation that will be much more effective in that in that front. Um, my final question: You you spoke a bit about having a discussion with others with the global community about the situation in Ukraine and the impacts of that on on how the situation in Tibet is perceived. I'd love to hear more about that, if I could. Uh, that's, we are still trying to learn from each other uh, how they perceive the uh, evolving uh, crisis in Ukraine and what implications uh, whatsoever post-Ukraine will have on Russia and its relation with China and what role China is playing right now, because every one of us knows that uh, the Chinese are also now translating what is going on in the Chinese social media, and Chinese social media is very controlled by the state. So what state allows the people to speak about and what they should not allow to spe uh, speak about, that's very clear. The Chinese government supports Russia. And I, uh, I have a feeling that they have an understanding between themselves. There are a lot of talks about uh, the Chinese not very happy with Russia invading Ukraine even before the Olympics is over. It seems they had an agreement. But uh, Chinese are also very afraid of secondary sanctions from the West. So I think uh, we have to understand that we are not the butter all the time. We have a Tibetan saying, the butter and the stone. You throw the stone at the butter, the butter and you store the sto butter at the stone also the butter loses but you should not think that I think the in international trade here with Canada also you import 25 billion uh, the, you you export 25 billion worth of goods but China imports more than 77 billion worth of goods so the trade imbalance is very stuck and if there is a 30 uh, seconds. trade sorry trade uh, trade war also it's going to it's China going to lose it's not just one side it's it has to be both ways. Second round, uh, five-minute rounds and two-and-a-half-minute rounds. Uh, first up is uh, MP Abutayev. Please proceed, sir. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for um, your visit today and uh, the delegation that you have. Uh, human rights violations is uh, number one issue uh, that uh, been practiced by China against the Tibet region and, and the people there. Um, all kind of uh, denial of, of fundamental rights, uh, whether rights to freedom, uh, expressions, to uh, belief, to practice, and, and also to freedom of movement. Uh, but um, in, in this course of history, it seems like uh, the stronger China gets, the more uh, the violation is increasing toward that specific region. And that's definitely where the concern is, because that can es escalate to um, uh, more what, uh, God forbid, but more what we see now happening in Ukraine. Um, what, how do you see the, the future uh, moving forward uh, based on the, uh, China getting stronger and getting more aggressive on the world stage, not just in, in the region, but uh, definitely since Tibet is, you know, on, on uh, the geography is there, how do you see the future? I feel there is a lot of insecurity on the part of China. They are belligerents against India, uh, they're keeping the hotspots going on in Taiwan and South and South China Sea. I try to analyze the situation, understand the geopolitical and geostrategic issues as much as possible, but I see no other reason for them uh, to do all this apart from keeping Communist Party alive. Uh, 
so if there is no Communist Party, there is no international relations, there is no international trade. Um, uh, we have been talking about China's uh, violations for over so many years, so many decades, but only now the international community is waking up to the reality. So I think it's time for recalibration of your policies to understand that China is not going to be a responsible power, however strong they become. But then there is also this Achilles heel of China where they feel very, very insecure because they spend more money on internal security than external security. Uh, that itself is symbolic of the deep distrust between the rulers and the ruled. So uh, when the Communist Party is threatened, then they are going to definitely do something with India or Taiwan or South China, South, South China Sea to instill nationalism for the Communist Party to survive. Diplomatic efforts to explain uh, or to make uh, the, the awareness better on a world stage among many countries uh, is definitely noticeable. And uh, that's going to also require the leadership, a continuity on the leadership on your side. And that's another concern. So um, where do you see that, uh, that golden time, the golden moment that's going to come? Because it will happen in the course of history where the opportunity comes for uh, an, uh, an improvement, could be a historic improvement for the region. It's very difficult to predict when it's going to happen, but as Buddhists, we believe in impermanence, just as uh, Westerners say, change is the only constant. But the question is when the change is going to come. So we are watching the situation, and then whenever the change, when they, whenever there's an opportunity, we should be able to seize it, but then we need the support of the international community also with all the like-minded countries coming together, not just one or two countries supporting. Well, the, beside surveillance, which is also a big concern um, that, that's happening in the region and inside China too, do you see that some people inside uh, the, the, the territory of China on the opposite side of Tibet, do you see that there uh, a sentiment there that they can understand your concern as a region? And they, uh, they may at some point meet halfway to help you to uh, get a, a better uh, deal than the, way, uh, the one that you have right now. Within the Chinese leadership also, we know they are the hardliners and the softliners. Uh, I think uh, uh, President, uh, uh, former President Hu Jintao also is now concerned, now realizes that he regrets, we understand that he regrets that they appointed Xi Jinping as his successor, but it's too late into the day. But uh, we l let's see what happens in his third term, because there has to be sharing of bread. Uh, Xi Jinping cannot eat all the bread by himself. Your neighbors to, to the oh. south, um, uh, do you see, can you explain to us uh, the level of cooperation you're having there? Uh, in India? Yes. Uh, uh, India has been very kind to us. If it has not been India, we would not be where we are today. So uh, we are very thankful to the government and people of India for their support, and we have a very transparent relationship with India. Uh, and can that go along to Pakistan too? Pakistan earlier used to have better relations with the uh, United States and thereby when we, when we send our first CIA trainees to be trained in Saigon and Camp Peary and Colorado, we used to send Tibetans from right, Bangladesh, East time. Pakistan. I'm sorry for this round. Uh, Ms. Bendai, and you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Sikyong, thank you for attending our uh, parliamentary um, committee today. Uh, you referenced in earlier testimony um, the, uh, the the plight and the similarities, indeed, uh, with the Muslim Uyghurs uh, in, in China. I wonder if you could uh, comment on, on the following information uh, that I have read recently. A Reuters article from September 22nd, 2002, uh, stated, and I quote, China is pushing a growing number of Tibetan rural laborers off the land and into recently built military-style training centers, where they are turned uh, into factory workers, mirroring a program in western Xinjiang region that rights groups have branded coercive labor, uh, end quote. Um, the article states that Beijing has set quotas for the mass transfer of rural laborers, and they um, estimate um, over a half a million people uh, involved uh, in, in those transfers. I would also like uh, your comment on 
a recent report of December 2021 indicating that the Tibet Action Institute um, has looked at the colonial boarding uh, schools uh, run uh, by China and are conservatively estimating that at least 800,000 Tibetan children are now housed in these state-run institutions being forcibly separated from their families um, with the goal, obviously, as you also mentioned earlier in your testimony, um, to uh, deny them their culture, their religion, their language, and in, indeed uh, their family. Taken together, I wonder if you could comment on um, the, these policies and what they mean to you and your people. Um, the, it's, uh, we are, after I assumed office, we are focusing a lot more on studying the situation inside Tibet so, because we don't want to be uh, misinforming the international community as to what is happening there. So we're still in the process of developing the information management system, and information gathering and processing and repackaging and uh, uh, doing it for the uh, advocacy work. But the Tibet Action Institute report is very, very... Uh, concerning because they're talking about 78% of Tibetan students being put in boarding schools. And when you point that out to the Chinese, they always point fingers at the United States government for how they treated the natives or the Canadian government for how they treated their First Nations. The United States and Canada realizes its mistake and are making up for it. China knows that it's wrong, but they still do it in Tibet. That's very unfortunate. Thank you, sir. Um, just this week uh, here in Canada and indeed in many countries around the world, uh, we observed World Press Freedom Day. It was on May 3rd. And uh, that day uh, recognizes the importance of uh, free media and uh, journalistic freedom. I wonder, Sikyong, if you can comment on the current state of press freedom in Tibet. The, according to Freedom House, uh, Tibet is the second country uh, with the least uh, freedom. Uh, including access to uh, information and the media. So uh, uh, the one big concern, China always tells something to the international community and they tell something to their domestic audience. So this, unless there is freedom of information and access to journalists about what's happening there, and that's also the reason why things are not coming out of Tibet. You. Forget about uh, journalists, but even ordinary Tibetans, if they are caught sending out any information out of Tibet, then you are caught. If you, you receive information into Tibet, and if you don't redistribute that, still you are safe. But if you redistribute that, then you, are, you land in serious problem. So free flow of information, I think, should be the basis to find, uh, to, to free not just the Tibetan people, but also the whole of China from the grip of Chinese propaganda. Uh, thank you. And do you fear yourself facing any sanctions for coming here to speak to us and, 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 and to others about what is going on in Tibet? I, uh, they cannot do anything to me because uh, uh, they, they anyway don't allow uh, us to come into Tibet. So and I, my distant relatives, I don't know whether they know about them or not. I, I haven't seen them for my life. I have never, never been to Tibet. So to fulfill, to fulfill my emotional needs, I try to go to the border areas and see Tibet through the fences. Uh, so there's nothing that Chinese government can do to me unless they send somebody to kill me. There's nothing they can do to me. Would I don't like fear to go, any sanctions. Would you like to return to Tibet one day, sir? Happily. That's what we are looking forward to. But unfortunately, it's, uh, it doesn't look very likely pretty soon. But we are working Thank you, towards uh, that. Ms. Uh, Bandayan, uh, that's five minutes. Now we're going to go to Mr. Bergeron for two minutes, 30 seconds. Please proceed, sir. Merci. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sik Young and Venerable Tenzin Rabial, in your presentations, well, perhaps first, when we're faced with this type of situation, we see it with the conflict in Ukraine currently. The question we ask, the question that eats at us and keeps us up at night is what can we do? What can we do? It's a question we asked when your predecessor appeared before the Special Canada-China Canada Relations Committee. 
and you mentioned a very specific action that is expected from Canada, that is to speak to Chinese authorities to ask for an update on the Panchen Lama. I imagine you've already made similar requests to other governments. Those actions from different governments throughout the world, have they had any effect to obtain news on the Panchen Lama? Uh, including the United Nations, uh, <clears throat> it has no, not yielded any results so far. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, the Secretary General Michelle Bachelet, when uh, she visits uh, China this time, whether she will be pressing China for more information on Pension Lama, because Chinese government keeps saying that he is healthy, he doesn't want to be disturbed, he is being educated. You know, it's already 33 years now. Uh, he's he's 33 years old now. So uh, uh, I, uh, unless there is multilateral pressure from everybody. China is not going to respond positively, and that has been the case for that many years. And uh, I'm, I, I have a lot of uh, skepticism when it comes to the United Nations. Our office has been there in Geneva for so many decades, but even the Secretary General men doesn't mention Tibet in our statements. That's very unfortunate. And uh, I consider United Nations as one of the most undemocratic institutions in the world, next to maybe FIFA. So. Uh, well, it's, uh, we hope, but the veto power of these nations are too too dangerous. It, it's, it doesn't help the whole community. There should be change in the structure of the United Nations. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bergeron. Now we'll move on to uh, Ms. McPherson for two and a half minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, thank you to our witnesses today. You, you spoke about the... Um, what's happening in Ukraine and, and with the Russian Federation invading and the impacts on China and how China will could potentially see a need to to um, increase nationalism and so that there are risks for, for Taiwan, risks for Tibet uh, at that time. I'd like you to explain that a little bit more to us so that we have that on the record. And, and if you could, just to touch upon the what we've already seen, the loss of language, of culture um, in, t in Tibet and, and what we have, to, you know, what will p the potential losses will be going forward, if you could. Uh, the Ukraine-China situation, the Ukraine situation, uh, now we'll have to see how much China is trying to help covertly or overtly to support Russia, because I strongly believe that there is some level of agreement between the Russians and the Chinese when it uh, came to Ukraine. But otherwise, uh, you, uh, Russia alone may not have the capacity to take this on uh, with the whole of Europe or the NATO. Uh, and uh, uh, China has always supported countries who are, uh, if we can call them, rogue nations, anybody who, authoritarian nations, countries who don't support human rights, they have always been working together to preserve their own, uh, their, their like-mindedness again. So that is a very dangerous trend. So let us see whether it's going to be an ideological war between the free world and the authoritarian regimes around the world. And if the authoritarian regimes gain upper hand, it's going to be very, very difficult for the world community in the years to come. A uh, new global order that will be dangerous, uh, that does not respect any international law, uh, that is going to set a very bad precedent uh, for the whole uh, world community. <laughs> And the impacts on, if you could give some impacts on the, the, the further impacts that we'll have on Tibet. Uh, further impacts on uh, uh, on language and culture. Um, the more China becomes stronger uh, and aligns with the uh, other authoritarian countries, then they, this will lead to more uh, 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 stronger uh, laws. Even now, they are already re reinterpreting the Chinese constitution when it comes to language and 
culture, what is provided there in the Chinese constitution and what is being implemented on the ground are totally two different things. That is what Chinese always do. Sorry, I have because to, communism uh, is always on built on lies. Mr. Chong, you have the floor for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for appearing in front of our committee. Um, in March of last year, the Government of Canada announced sanctions against certain Chinese officials for their participation in gross and systemic human rights violations against the Uyghur Muslim minority in Xinjiang province in China, just north of Tibet. So I have two questions. First, how do you view the effectiveness of these sanctions against these particular Chinese officials and entities? And secondly, what is the likelihood that applying similar sanctions against uh, Chinese officials in the Tibetan autonomous region uh, would improve the human rights record uh, of the PRC in uh, Tibet? Uh, again, uh, one has to understand how Communist China functions. Uh, Communist China functions based on the authorities uh, that comes from the central level. So if you have to sanction the leaders in Uyghur, they, they, their actions are also approved by the central leadership. So then you will have to start sanctioning from the president himself. Then only will there be some uh, impact. Otherwise, uh, uh, sanctioning officials at the lower level alone does not help because they have the support of the central leadership and it doesn't they don't mind, and some uh, some people don't mind going, going out of their country, so it doesn't help just not granting them visas. But China uses visa always as a very important tool uh, to bar people from uh, speaking out against Chinese human rights abuses and other issues. So uh, if there has to be sanctions, the sanctions has to be begin from the top level. That is how communist government functions. Thank you. Um, just over a year ago, uh, Canada's ambassador to China, Ambassador Dominic Barton, <coughs> visited Lhasa from the 26th to the 30th of October in 2020, um, the first visit by a Canadian government official to Tibet uh, since 2015. Uh, my question is, given the highly controlled uh, nature of these organized trips by the PRC to Tibet, uh, how do you view their effectiveness? Do you think they are trips that g Canadian government and other government officials from uh, other democracies should participate in, or do you view them as a, a tool of uh, propaganda? It is definitely a tool of propaganda. I don't know how much the ambassador has been briefed about the situation inside Tibet before his visit, but then uh, I think you need a lot more briefing because these are all conducted tours uh, by the government uh, who wants the ambassadors or visitors to see only those places and institutions and the people they want them to see. So that does not reflect <clears throat> the reality of the situation inside Tibet. If Tibet has been turned into a socialist paradise, as they claim, then why can't they allow not just ambassadors, but also uh, people from uh, all walks of life to go, come into Canada, uh, to come in, uh, that comes into China? So, therefore, I would urge the Canadian Parliament to uh, move uh, sim a similar uh, act like the United States, uh, recipro because reciprocity is the, diplomacy, uh, the foundation of diplomatic relations and reciprocal access to Tibet or Uyghur. That is very important because any Chinese can come to any part of Canada. There's no restriction for any Chinese to visit any part of Canada. But if a Canadian goes to Tibet or uh, China, then you need another permit to go into Tibet. Uh, there is no reciprocity in that. If Chinese are not afraid about showing what socialist paradise they have turned Tibet into, then why don't they allow people to come in and see for themselves? Why only select people like ambassadors who are taken on a selected piece, uh, parts of uh, the institutions and areas they want them to see? And the ambassador, I'm sure, ambassador may not have been. Of course, I'm, we are not denying that there's development in Tibet. There is development, but again, the development is for whom? Uh, that is a big question. Well, thank you for that answer. Uh, final question I have is, in your opening remarks, you mentioned you would like to see the adoption of a motion uh, by this committee 
and uh, by the House of Commons regarding the resumption of the Sino-Tibetan dialogue. Could you maybe elaborate on that? <clears throat> because uh, some people even question me the relevance of the middle way approach <clears throat> today, and I uh, keep saying that it is more relevant than ever before. We saw Ukraine, the destruction that has gone into it, the amount of money that went into the life and the lives and properties. So the middle way approach is based on nonviolence as a means. And nonviolence can be the only way in this 21st century to resolve conflicts. And that is what His Holiness has been doing over the, so many decades. He even deters. It's not like Tibetans cannot Sorry take to interrupt violence. again, uh, Mr. Varani, you have the floor. So, uh, Sik Young I want to continue with a couple of points. Uh, one is just to preface the comment about Ambassador Barton's trip. So, uh, he was briefed uh, definitely by the Canada Tibet Committee, and I know there's members of the Canada Tibet Committee here in the room. And I think the more access, the better uh, in terms of going in with eyes wide open into the region. But I want to go back to something that you started on about, uh, and I think uh, 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 Rabi Al Rinpoche also referenced it, and it's the immolations. And one thing that I recollect from what Ambassador Barton came back and talked about, about Lhasa, is, uh, and I want to raise this with you squarely, is that we've now had 157 people, and I think in the last 10 to 20 years, who have immolated. Buddhism is a pacifist religion. This is really shocking that this is what it comes to for people to make a point. Uh, but he mentioned things such as individuals uh, who are security officials of the Chinese uh, in Lhasa, uh, not just carrying guns, but carrying fire extinguishers because they are so concerned about the potential for immolations. So can you comment on the situation and how it has gotten to this stage that people are immolating so frequently and what desperation, how their desperation leads them to that situation? And the two latest uh, cases of self-immolation, including Sawan Nobu, who is a very young 25-year-old boy, a singer and very promising carrier, he is born after the Cultural Revolution. He has not seen cultural, he would not witness cultural. He only sees what the Chinese government is doing to Tibet and Tibetans today. And that is uh, itself evidence of uh, the, the policies and programs that Chinese government implements in Tibet that does not help the Tibetans as a people and China as a nation. And there is a lot of frustration because there is, you cannot voice your concerns. Uh, there is no freedom of thought, there is no freedom of speech, there is no freedom of movement, then your life is reduced to that of an animal. Uh, uh, that is why they are forced, even 81 years old, so even there, this you see the range of uh, people uh, uh, committing uh, self immolations uh, hoping against hope that there will be some response from the Chinese or the international community. And can I raise another issue that you mentioned in your opening statement, which was the environmental concerns? And I know we've heard about this in Parliament. Uh, we had uh, received in the 42nd Parliament uh, His Holiness the Karmapa, who also talks a lot about uh, Tibet as the water tower of Asia, how the Tibetan high mountain plateau, the, uh, the ice melting feeds uh, as many as 10 of Asia's major rivers, from the Mekong to the, to the Ganges, etc., uh, can you ex explain how critical it is, the situation with respect to the environmental concerns on the Tibetan high mountain plateau? And then I understand there's also been recent repercussions against Tibetan environmental activists who have also spoken out about this importance, and they themselves have faced repercussions from the People's Republic of China. If you could address that, please. So if it's not uh, only Tibet uh, uh, when it comes to the plateau of Tibet, which is 12,000 feet above sea level on average, and... Uh, there is the huge, the, I think the next big thing is going to be water security in the region. So it's all the downstream countries who are facing a lot of problems because China uses Tibet's water as a tap. They have built so many dams on the Mekong alone before it close, uh, flows into the next country, there are some 32 dams. So it, when they let it flow, if uh, it causes flooding and then it dries up, even they stop it. So water security is going to be a huge problem and it's some, as some say that this could lead to a third world war, so who knows. Uh, today we are political refugees, but in a uh, few decades to come there might be so many more environmental refugees because about 2 billion people directly or indirectly uh, depend on China's Tibet's uh, water, uh, that water that originates from the Tibetan plateau. 
in my last remaining uh, 40 seconds here, if we could just talk about building alliances on this goal about ensuring there's more accountability with China. We've got the Taiwanese trade representative here. That is terrific. We've talked about the Uyghurs. We can talk about Tiananmen. We can talk about uh, issues like Hong Kong democracy dissenters. How can we as parliamentarians help you gather alliances to put more of a focus on China and the human rights abuses that we are seeing? It's very important that uh, the countries work, administrations work with administrations, parliamentarians work with parliamentarians to build alliances on your front. And then we will work with the Uyghurs and the Mongols and the Hong Kongers to find common ground to face common challenges because the issues are different, right? backgrounds are different. But despite that, we face the same opponent. To Congratulations on your recent election as Sikyong as well. Welcome Thank to Canada on your first official visit. Thank you. Tujichina. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Now, for the third round, I think just uh, save time to deal with the motion. We're going to go to four and two minute rounds. Uh, first up is uh, Mr. Genius. You have the floor for four minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I've, uh, I've really appreciated hearing from, from the witnesses. And I know there are, we're all subject to these, these time constraints. So um, I wonder if you could uh, speak just further about the environmental issues. Uh, it's it's interesting to me that I think some people have a, a misperception about the government of China's environmental performance, um, and uh, so I, I wonder if you could just share a bit more about maybe how that misperception can be countered, recognizing uh, the real threats to the environment that we're seeing in Tibet uh, and the implications for the region. Uh, we, in our prayers, also we uh, we say. Uh, the Tibet uh, is uh, the heavenly abode, uh, land surrounded by snow mountains. Uh, the Westerners started calling Tibet as the roof of the world. The Asians started calling Tibet as the water tower of Asia. Now the environmental Chinese, si Chinese environmental scientists call Tibet as the third pole because Tibet has the largest amount of glaciers and permafrost that feeds all these major rivers that flows into Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Burma, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, and into China itself. And the, all the 50% of the water in China is polluted. Tibet is the only place that has pristine water and a pristine, fragile environment. So it's very important for the whole region that Tibet's environmental issues are addressed, ecological uh, uh, issues are taken care of, so there should be more collaboration between the Chinese environmental scientists and international environment scientists to come out with detailed analytical uh, study of the environmental situation uh, that will help the whole region. Uh, thank you, thank you, Sikyong, and uh, it, it might be worthwhile next time you're in Canada to have you meet with the Environment Committee because I know these issues are very important and we can pursue them further. Uh, one of the issues that we've been highlighting is concerns about uh, foreign state-backed interference in Canada and other countries around the world, uh, the impact that this has on uh, the Tibetan community, the Uyghur community, uh, and uh, and really Canadians of all backgrounds who are raising concerns about uh, about human rights and about uh, about aggressive actions by by the Chinese government and by by other foreign states. Um, could you share uh, your perspective on efforts by the Chinese government to influence events beyond its borders uh, and concerns that we're hearing specifically from Tibetan Canadians about uh, those, those uh, influences being present here in Canada? Uh, now, transnational repression has become a term which was not there earlier. Uh, <clears throat> China always talks about Tibet, Uyghur being domestic issues, internal affairs, where they don't want the international community to interfere. But on the other hand, the, now they have uh, made the, the United Work Front very, very proactive in the international community. This organization used to be responsible for creating problems within the national, nationalities within China. But now it has extended its arms beyond China through the transnational repression. You have witnessed here in the form of Chimil Hamo uh, by using the Students and Scholars Association, by the consulates and the embassies. And uh, we really urge the Canadian government to protect your own people, your own citizens, when they face such repressions. And whenever we have cases, we will definitely be reporting to your authorities. 
30 seconds. Uh, thank you. Well, I, I appreciate you mentioning the case of, of Chimi Lamo. Uh, she was a graduate of the uh, parliamentary internship program we have here for uh, Tibetan young people, and I think many of us here uh, participate in that program. It's, it's great to see uh, the contribution to Parliament and to so many other walks of life that are being made by, uh, by Tibetan Canadians and, and all the things they, they go on to do. Um, uh, advocating for the Tibetan cause, yes, but contributing to Canadian life in so many other ways. So once again, I want to thank you for, for being here, and I just recognize the contribution of the Tibetan Canadian community as well. Thanks. Mr. McKay, you have the floor for four minutes. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and um, good to see you again, Sung. Um, two questions. The, the first question uh, has to do with a comment you just made about uh, China spending more money on its internal security than it spends on its external security. Uh, I think we have some feel for the ex expenditures on external security, which is a massive amount of money. Um, but I'd be curious as to um, how how much money is actually getting spent on internal security, and and where is it getting spent? Uh, I don't have the exact numbers right now. Uh, I will be happy to submit a, a report on this, but. Uh, the much of the money is spent on state security, whether it's to do, to do with the uh, uh, functions of the security apparatus that are in Tibet, with the United Workfront, with the intelligence, with the surveillance systems that are placed in all the monasteries and individuals. So all that adds up to more money being spent in Tibet than in other regions of China. Uh, because they consider Tibet as always a very sensitive area. These are the areas they spent money on. Um, I think it was Henry Kissinger who said the, uh, that nations only operate in their, uh, in their own interests. Um, I would be curious to know um, how you would explain to Canadians on the street why they should care about what goes on in Tibet. Why is it in Canada's interest to pay attention to what, uh, what is happening in Tibet and, for that matter, other regions, uh, regions in and around China, uh, which are quite foreign to most, most Canadians and, you know, in some instances would be, Canadians would be hard-pressed to find Tibet on a map. Um, so why should they care about what is obviously an egregious situation um, and only only getting worse. Why is it in Canada's interest? Why is it in Canadians' interest to care about Tibet? Only when problems come to your door, then only you realize that it's happening. Uh, otherwise, you feel it's too far away. But we all know that the interde interdependence, uh, interdependent nature of how we exist so anything that happens in a small part of the world affects the larger uh, community, international community. It's not like before. Now things are changing. And then with trade, as I mentioned before, I try to check the volume of trade between Canada and China. And it's 25 percent your export to China and 77 percent being imported into. And China makes money out of this. And they use all this money again to, uh, to repress their own people or not follow the um, international rules. But I think what is more important is the Canadian values. Uh, if, there, if the Canadian value has to be promoted internationally, then Canada has to work towards not within Canada, but in the whole international community to promote your values that you cherish. That was how many minutes? 45 seconds. I have an interest in uh, forced labor. In fact, I, I tabled a, uh, a bill on the floor of the House this week. I would be interested in your comments as to uh, how much of the goods coming out of, um, of China, indeed out of Tibet for that matter, um, uh, are products of forced labor. We are doing a study on that. I think uh, as and when we finish that, we will be able to present it to you. In the good. Future. Please, if you could, the clerk would be, uh, this committee would be very interested in that. Thank I would be very interested. Please, uh, interested. please submit you. that to the clerk when it's available. Uh, Mr. Bergeron, you have the floor for two minutes. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On January 29th, during a virtual meeting with a number of Tibetan associations in Canada, Namgal Shodup, representative Tibet in North America, mentioned 
the importance of communicating with Chinese students in Canada. The Dalai Lama, His Holiness, said we need to build better understanding between Chinese and Tibet society. Do you feel that Chinese students in Canada are really aware of the situation in Tibet and will communicating with Chinese students allow dialogue to foster better understanding? And the question that is connected to this is, do you think there's a danger that these students could suffer repression from Chinese authorities. Yeah, uh, the, we, we always try to reach out to the Chinese. Uh, as His Holiness always says, we are not against the Chinese people because Chinese are also human beings, just as we are. So every human being needs happiness. Uh, uh, that's why uh, during all our meetings to, in Washington, D.C., New York, and uh, to, to, in, on Sunday in Toronto also, I'll be meeting with another 60, 70 Chinese. Uh, so we always try to reach out to the Chinese and try to explain to them the situation inside Tibet. But, but uh, unfortunately, the students that come from inside China to study here, they do not have too much freedom. So they have this Student Scholars Association, which are used by the consulates to uh, to come and protest whenever they want them to do. Otherwise, they will not be allowed to go back into China or they may face a lot of uh, 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 actions from the Chinese government. So they always fear that despite... And you have a lot of Chinese in Canada who has... who enjoys Canadian freedom and Canadian values. Uh, and I think some politicians think that uh, if they support Tibet, they lose Chinese friendship or Chinese votes. That should not be the case because the Chinese who live in Canada enjoy freedom here and they should be supporting uh, human values that Canada cherishes then supporting the Chinese government, if not only for being able to go back to China. That is the weapon China uses all the time, not granting visas. Uh, Ms. McPherson for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, thank you for, for all of your testimony, all your information. The, the information about the human rights abuses, the loss of culture, language, religion, uh, the attacks on, on the Tibetan people uh, have been very, very illuminating for me. Thank you. Uh, like my colleague, Mr. McKay, I'm, I'm very eager to see the report on forced labor and child labor that, that, um, that you'll be providing to us. So thank you for that as well. You know, as the last the last member of parliament asking questions today, I would just like to give you one more opportunity to to tell us how we can help, what what the Canadian Parliament can do, what members of parliament can do to help you. If um, if you could just take the last few minutes to do that, please. To start with, if you can adopt a reciprocal access to Tibet Act, uh, then we can take on from there. Uh, on larger issues. And uh, till such a time that there is a political situ uh, solution to the, the Sino-Tibet conflict, uh, one of my job is to keep my community com impact, co compact together. And we are witnessing a lot of demographic and social changes and also challenges that we face because of that. And I have put forward a proposal to the international development on, uh, uh, on a humanitarian support uh, 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 for the Tibetans in in the exile community as well as the Tibetan community in Canada uh, for them to be able to learn their language and culture. So we have uh, five Tibetan communities in Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, in uh, Alberta region and Calgary and Vancouver, BC. And uh, I will also make it a point to uh, present you this book uh, later. I think it's lying with the Wallenberg uh, institution. So this will be forwarded to you, and there is also a suggestion on policy recommendations for course correct. So if you go through that, I think we can save a little more time uh, 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 for practical uh, actions that uh, Canadians can take. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to um, move on to the motion now. Um, so let's continue debates on, on the motion. Oh, I'm, um, well, the meeting is still on. The meeting is not adjourned. 
the witnesses can, we'd like the witnesses to stay while we deal with the motion. Um, uh, so, um, speakers to the motion. Who's up? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm not sure if that decision is debatable, but I think out of respect for the witnesses, uh, while we engage in, in this discussion, it would be more appropriate for the witnesses to be released. Well, it's, uh, I think well, I, I, was, I, I was hoping everyone would get a picture with them before we're, we're done, so I don't really want them to, to, to leave. So, But they're welcome to, uh, if they're willing to stay till we're done with the motion for a picture, then... Um, I wouldn't mind standing up for a picture and then coming back to debate. Mr. Mr. Chair, maybe I could suggest that you could suspend the meeting for five minutes to allow photos to That's be an excellent taken, Mr. and then we could resume the meeting with the continuation of the debate on the motion. We will suspend. Uh, we're now resuming um, the meeting, so we are we are live. Um, uh, so, um, uh, with respect to the, uh, we are we are uh, we've resumed the meeting now. So, I think we should continue uh, debate on the motion. Who who would like to start, Mr. V are we in camera now, or are we... No, this is uh, in public. We're okay. resuming the motion. Um, that was uh, Mr. Genio's tabled early. That is, I think, being amended and sub-amended. 
so if I could then continue with the amendment, um, and and my my understanding is that we we have kind of reached an agreement between conservatives and liberals, but I haven't had a chance to bring Bloc Québécois and uh, and Heather. Did she? She'll be back. All right. I just. Anyway, <laughs> just didn't want to begin without her. Uh, so, so there's a, a, a reworking of the motion uh, that I, I that, that the clerk has sent around, and uh, but I think we're going to rework it again. So it would read that this committee call for dialogue between representatives of the Tibetan people, his, in, which would include the Holy His Holiness the Dalai Lama, or his representatives, and or the Central Tibetan Administration. Remember, we worked on that language a lot at CACN. And the government of the People's Republic of China, with a view to enabling Tibet to exercise genuine autonomy within the framework of the Chinese Constitution, and report this to the House with a government response. So that would be, and ask for a government response. Um, and, and, and the reason we're doing that, uh, we actually... And I will be very clear, um, we don't want to take time on a, a concurrence debate on this because I think we want to get this done here. So we would uh, ask for the uh, government response, but with the hope that we're all committed in this room to work with our House leaders to make sure that we do not get into a concurrence debate on this uh, because we don't want to take House time. Not that Tibet's not an important issue, it's precisely the opposite. We want it to be, uh, we don't want a political division on this. So that would be our, our hope to do. So if we're agreed to that language that uh, Mr. Bergeron presented, we've all agreed to before, and so I hope that will work. Good. Okay. Excellent. Wow. Well, um, just before we vote, I want to say I was uh, very, very moved by the testimony we had today, and uh, and uh, certainly it was very informative, and um, there's lots lots to unpack and discuss here. But uh, with that, Ms. Bendine? Yeah. Um, I understand uh, from my colleague, Mr. Oliphant, uh, who spent a long time on the Canada-China Committee in the previous uh, mandate, um, that an extensive study was, was done on this issue. I was, I was not, uh, you know, part of, of that committee, but I wonder, um, you know, what uh, the, the clerks have as instructions, and I, I apologize if this has already cleared everybody else, in terms of the testimony we heard today. And to your point, Mr. Chair, I, I agree with you, and I, I just wonder what what the um, analysts or uh, had intended to do with the testimony we heard today. That's the problem. Mr. Chair, I did not realize that there was a motion on the floor. If you would like to proceed to the vote, I thought that it was that we had agreed to unanimously. No, to no, I just um, I made that interjection uh, just before I was about to call the vote. My apologies, yeah, I can ask. That's, oh, it's my my fault for interjecting, but I just felt like I should say something before we get into the vote. But um, uh, so why don't we do? Why don't we vote on the motion? Sounds like everyone's on uh, the same. Sorry, we're voting on the amendment. Okay. Um, Vote on the men? Do we need a recorded vote? No? Okay, we're agreed on the amendment. Now on the main motion? A recorded vote on the motion just to put it on the record? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, just, just to. Okay, we're going to have a. Put it on the record. There's a call for a recorded vote on the main motion then. Um, as, as amended. Thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. The vote is on the main motion as amended. Ms. Ben Dian. We. Ms. Bradford. Ms. LaPointe. Yes. Mr. Oliphant. Yes. Mr. Virani. Yes. Mr. Abul Taif. Yes. Mr. Chong. Yes. Mr. Genuis. Yes. Monsieur Bergeron. Oui. Ms. McPherson. Oui. Mr. Chair, that is all in favor. Now, I'm not clear on the rules around here, and I know it's not a tie, but am I allowed to be recorded and support as well? Do I have unanimous consent for it to be recorded in support? 
Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Morantz? Yeah, uh, yes. Thank you. Okay, um, so now I think we're going to go, oh, to Ms. Diane's question, Ms. Van Diane's question. Um, Je peux le, le répéter si vous voulez, c'était simplement. I can repeat it if you want. It was just to see with the analysts if they had the intention of preparing something specific with the testimony we heard today. And what do you propose as options for the committee? Um, they, I, I'm told that the analysts need, would need direction from us as to what to produce. I don't know if a formal report could be done. Um, we are doing, we have the motion. And there is, of course, the transcript of the discussion in Hansard's. So I'm not sure what else, unless anyone has anything in mind. Uh, Mr. Abutif? Thank you, Chair. Uh, this, uh, this meeting was a public meeting, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. So if public meeting, I think we're going to be questioned over the content of it. And uh, it would be nice if the committee put a report on that uh, for the records, because it's a public info already. Uh, Mr. Bergeron? Monsieur le Président. Mr. Chair, correct me if I'm mistaken, but from my understanding, when we heard Mr. Sangay, the motion from Mr. Oliphant was tabled in the House as a report from the committee. So we could do exactly the same thing this time consider the motion that we just adopted as a report from the committee tabled in the House of Commons and that would be that would be it that's all oh that's already been agreed to I, I think what Ms. Bendine is asking if there's anything and Mr. Abutev, Abutev is if there's anything in addition um, the committee could produce uh, regarding the testimony we've heard today Mr. Olafon? I think a middle way may be that we uh, take the highlights of the testimony, put it into a press release, and couple it with the motion that we've made. Um, and I think, so it's not really a study report, because we didn't really do a study, but I think we have more than the motion. So a couple of quotes that we heard that were important uh, could be presented by the analysts into a, not a lengthy uh, press release, but a highlights that we met with them, this is what they said, and that this is a motion we passed. Uh, Mr. Chong, you have the floor. Yeah, I support what uh, Mr. Oliphant has suggested. We already have decided to report to the House uh, um, yeah. um, something regarding uh, what came out of the testimony, and yeah. I think um, the chair issuing a statement, a press release, I do agree combines both uh, Sorry. the report uh, that um, we've just agreed to send to the House, along with highlights of the testimony, would be a good way to uh, um, Any other? deal with the matter that Madame Bendayen has uh, raised. So, thank you. Any other comments on uh, Mr. Genius? Uh, uh, I agree. I would just uh, like to suggest that, in particular, we highlight some of those specific asks around the uh, the pension llama. Uh, case uh, in the in the press release because those were uh, uh, important other issues that were not mentioned in the motion that we we adopted. So I, I agree with the approach. I just want to put that uh, in as a suggestion as well. Okay, well, I, I agree with um, these suggestions. I think what we do is direct the analysts at this point to prepare a press release and we can have a look at it and, and see um, if it's uh, what we uh, cumulatively would like to see go out. I would worry it should be our press release, not his press release. So his press release would be about his asks for us. I I would be happier if we sort of focused on the more general terms. That he can give his own press release on the very specific asks. I think, frankly, I always hate complimenting Mr. Jenis, but I have to because I think what he did very well in his first round of questioning was acknowledge that we were hearing something and we would take it under consideration. I think that was important to be said, but I think you were very cautious to not, you know, fully take it. So I thought, I thought your wording was very good. I noted it, in fact. So I think the press release should really be our press release on what we heard. I think when the Tibetans come, we, we all start loving each other as well. It's, it's, it's amazing. Happens, it's the, uh, just the we need to uh, go on camera now to deal with committee business. So uh, <laughs> Before this gets I'm, weird. I'm going to exercise the chair's... <laughs> Chair's prerogative, uh, analysts, please prepare a press release for our review, um, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, look at it once it's received. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, now we're going to adjourn uh, this. No, suspend, suspend. No adjourn, suspend, and go on camera. <laughs>